thank you very much. Uh, I'm supposed to defend myself at the beginning, but I actually only lost my wedding ring once. <laughs> the subsequent rings were not my wedding rings. <laughs> so uh, it's very touching that my mother actually decided to try again and again with. Uh, she said, well, it looked nice on you. So. <clears throat> I think the most beautiful thing a mind can do is to dream. I remember when my parents first took me uh, to see, see the venue of the 1978 World Championship match in the Philippines, in Baguio City. And I got to go and sit on the chairs where Kapu and Kochna had played um, and enjoy the whole uh, ambiance of it. Well, maybe uh, uh, the mind responded to the implications. So you know, maybe one day I could sit and play for the World Championship myself. And I'm sure that uh, Raji and everyone here at NU uh, feel the same way with the university. So the dream finally, uh, I, mean, I came here a bit earlier at the construction stage, and now uh, I think it's, it's a wonderful atmosphere to, uh, to be in for a student. Which brings me to my uh, first uh, I think, above all, the brain is something that needs stimulation. And here, the environment uh, plays a critical role. I think growing up in an artistic or intellectual home, well, you learn to think about certain subjects in a different way. But I think it's more fundamental. You develop a certain affinity, a certain closeness. Um, you're not intimidated by these subjects later in life. We all know this feeling that um, the impression you have about a subject very early uh, and the environment in which you face it has a huge influence on your life. Some, some people have phobias about certain things all their life. Some people are very comfortable even in complicated areas or difficult areas. And I think uh, the environment in which um, you study and work in is very important. I think it's similar in another way. My parents, for instance, um, never put a lot of pressure on me when I was playing chess. And they gave me a lot of uh, leeway uh, with, you know, how much time I could spend on chess and uh, how much time I could spend studying, which was quite unusual in those days, by the way. So uh, the feeling of not having this pressure might have also contributed to the fact that uh, chess was, some, was something for me that always uh, made me very enthusiastic and brought about sort of warm uh, feelings. The Second area I think a brain needs to, the way it works is, is serendipity. Um, you never know how things are going to work out. And the role of accident is quite huge. I was reading about a man called Dr. Gazaniga. And um, he's, one of, he, he's the person who did all these famous experiments back in the 50s and 60s with um, the left brain and the right brain establishing the uh, role of uh, each hemisphere in the way the brain operates. And recently he wrote a book saying, well, we established certain broad things. The right brain is really the artistic side. Uh, the left brain is more logical. It's the narrator and so on. But he said, I'm very scared by people trying to do uh, criminal work uh, based on these things, because certain functions are just very, very difficult to pinpoint. And the brain is something that's very difficult to use determinism for. And um, a lot of it is just very random. Or maybe we simply don't understand uh, how it works. In fact, the whole concept of shaping or building a brain, I think, implies a little bit like a sculpture, that you have certain control over the object. But if you think about it, the brain is something that, uh, well, could be argued, in fact, it's trying to shape itself. Uh, and we're not really in control of the brain and how to do many of the... So all we can do is provide the right environment uh, and the role of serendipity in this is quite huge. In fact, Dr. Gazaniga writes one funny story, which is when he was uh, uh, studying, he decided to write to Dr. Ferry, who was one of the world's leading researchers in this area. And he hesitated because well, he was really one of the world's leading researchers. But he decided to write a letter and say, you know, can I join you and uh, do my course with you? And of course, he got a letter saying, sure. 
So you'll never know unless you try. And uh, some of the most beautiful things in life happen uh, like that. Part of um, helping the brain grow is understanding the role of uh, connections. The brain is amazing in the sense that it's able to make connections between completely unrelated areas. And sometimes these are the breakthrough insights. Um, this is something that's very difficult to program or pin down. And um, I found this myself. In chess, I, I found that I grew as a chess player when I started making it a habit to follow um, even the areas of chess that I didn't need. So I didn't need them because they were not in my repertoire. I didn't need to deal with the position. So I could have ignored them. But you never know when a resource or an idea or a concept in one area suddenly works in another area. And it's useful to always keep this perspective and follow a lot of subjects that you might not need at once. Because you never know when you know, the brain is going to make a connection between the two. And last month, uh, I had this powerful feeling of recognizing something when I read about uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, it was right after he passed away. And um, one of the things he himself said was, the year he took, I mean, the six months I think he took off from uh, uh, computer science to do calligraphy. And if you think of that, and the role that uh, design played in his whole life, I think he's known much more for his aesthetics and his sense of design than really uh, computer science itself um, and computers. And so he described a little bit how he went for this course. It was actually in Oregon and he ambled off there and uh, stayed in a friend's apartment. But you never know when these connections are going to work out for you. And the influence can be very profound. Um, I don't think it came, it came down to a set of few insights. It's just when he, I think when he looked at something, he immediately started to think, does it look beautiful to my eyes and so on. And these connections that the brain makes, um, I, can, I can tell you myself in chess that there are certain uh, positions I've never needed to look at. But once you understand a certain um, fundamental geometry about it, then you find it, it colors your views on all other uh, parts of chess. So, um, in a way, it's like the seamlessness that uh, the uh, that is, you know, very much at the heart of NGO. Um It's a brilliant chance for the students, actually, to uh, interact with people from very diverse uh, uh, courses and viewpoints. I have the feeling that university is where this happens at its best because um, you're all closely congregated together and you get a chance to interact. Uh, like this. <clears throat> One of the most important things I have found with uh, regards to the brain is the role of emotions. Especially in something like chess. People tend to assume immediately that chess is very logical, it's very left brain. Uh, I'm often asked, what is there to discover? It's just uh, uh, calculation, right? There's either a good move or a bad move. Now, that may be true at some very fundamental level. But when humans play, emotions play a huge role in it. And of course, at the competitive level, it's almost 99% about emotions. It's not about uh, calculation. So the first thing is uh, the role of memory. In chess, it's very important. I mean, you must recognize that there are some things that you cannot uh, work out every single time at the board. Uh, in fact, that's why we study at all, so that you make your life slightly easier. You um, must be able to recall the right idea or concept at the right time and fill in the blanks there. And uh, in memory, the role of very powerful uh, memory, for instance, functions better when you have powerful emotional hooks um, and you, you can relate to something for a certain reason. For instance, I've read many, many things in school, but uh, I can't always uh, pinpoint exactly who um, uh, discovered a certain subject. Or, but who's ever going to forget a story about gravity and Newton? Because if you ask everyone, so an apple fell on his head. That kind of powerful emotional uh, uh, memory then helps your memory function much better. I, I can actually recall certain things. 
have to go over again and again and again. So how do I try to use this? Well, first of all, when I'm studying, uh, like I mentioned a bit earlier, areas that I don't specialize in, I try to find an expert who specializes in that area and follow them. But this means following them at all levels, following their results, and following a lot of their stories. It's very good to read their biographies and so on. Because then, if I know that, let's say, Ivanchuk did something in a certain position, I also remember why, and I remember a funny story with regard to that. And then, your memory just works much, much better. In chess, as, as well as, as in most other areas these days, we're drowning in information. Uh, the databases are exploding. And so, being able to use your memory effectively uh, to recall the right thing at the right point. I mean, you really want to remember it at that point in the game when you need it. Uh, a bit like Karna, you don't want to remember it for the rest of your life and then miss it at that one moment. Now, all emotions, I think, can be harnessed well. For instance, uh, if I um, have an opponent that I really dislike, then anger can be a wonderful motivator as well. I discovered that anger is good that you, if it has an outlet of some sort. If it sits inside you, that obviously it's a, it's a bad thing. But if it has some sort of outlet, um, if there's someone I really do, do not want to lose to, I defend much better against the guy, even if my position is bad. I, my brain just works, I find resources. Uh, you can hang in there much, much longer against someone you dislike. Alternately, if you're really angry about messing something up, uh, I remember I once lost a fairly simple rook end game. Rook end games are like the sort of, uh, you know, like your maths table or something, something you're just supposed to know in chess very early. Because they're going to happen again and again and again, all through your career. And you must know how to do the right things immediately. Uh, I lost a rook end game against uh, Peter Leko once. It was theoretically drawn. And I just had to know how to do it. I even knew the right idea, approximately. But still, I was careless. I felt that it should be easy to draw, it, that it's really not a difficult ending, because I knew it was uh, not to be drawn. I lost it. It cost me first place in Linares that year. But like I said, it's important to have an outlet. So I, I remember spending two weeks afterwards um, working on that ending and nothing else. And I discovered lots of fascinating stuff that I didn't know. Then there is embarrassment. I once uh, lost to a player called Beliatsky, um, where well, he was in time pressure. This means that he had very little time to make his last seven or eight moves. And I had an hour or something. And that is something that you, you know, it's known that you should never do, but I tried to do it nonetheless, which is I tried to play as fast as he was playing. But he was playing fast because he had no time. I was playing fast so that he couldn't take in my time. And you probably figured out that by playing fast, I put myself in the exact same situation as him. I didn't have any time either, for all practical interests and purposes. I was not using my excess time. So, um, after losing that game, I mean, I, I made a blunder, which is what you do when you play very fast without thinking. Um, for many, many years, I remembered, at move 35, if my opponent's in time pressure, sometimes I go and take a cup of coffee. Uh, if I have an hour, I'm going to use it and enjoy it. Um, and in fact, sometimes the opponent is just cooking in his own, you know, he's panicking, and he doesn't know when they're going to come back after your coffee, so he doesn't know how much time he has to think. But uh, these kinds of um, um, emotional hooks help you remember certain lessons very well. That's why, by the way, that um, uh, mistakes are useful, because a teacher may tell you something, but you will never appreciate a mistake till you make it yourself, and then it's either embarrassment or some other emotion that then never lets you forget this all your life. Um, it's, a, it's a reason why uh, we remember certain you know, school insults by a classmate much, much longer than certain other things that are much more useful. And um, I try to use this with my seconds. So when I have uh, these training camps for the matches, you know, you're dealing with a lot of information, but you're dealing in a sort of a theoretical abstract way. You cannot recreate the tournament atmosphere, the tension and the pressure of uh, the moves having consequences. You know, if you make a move there, you cannot take it back in a friendly way. Whereas when you're in the training camps, everything's okay, and you're pretending that you're trying to get to the heart of the position and so on. So what we do now is at the end of it, I go through a session where I have to sit in with a, a chessboard in pieces. 
my trainers a lot to use their computers and their um, so they are a lot to refer the notes and use the engine to check and they take me through a lot of key positions so the thing is okay uh, you think you mastered this area well let's play a little bit and um, this kind of rehearsal helps you actually get into the feeling of uh, being in a tournament but after five or six instances where you cannot remember the right move and your, your trainers are all sitting around you wondering how you ever became world champion then then this uh, you're embarrassed you're a little bit angry and chess players also have a lot of ego so you're a bit embarrassed to be in the situation but then when you go to the board sometimes big you remember everything immediately so um, i think emotions if harnessed properly um, like a, a powerful accelerator for the brain um, and the brain really responds to these things um, there are functions it does superbly and the functions it does quite badly and the reason the difference i think would be emotions the fourth one is um, the ability to take risks and when i was talking about the brain strengths this is really what i was thinking about that um, despite the steel that we supposed to like our comfort zone actually i think our brain lives for the day when it takes risks if you think about it no cat is ever going to die from lying on the sofa but cats risk their life very often because they're curious about something so in the same way um i mean adrenaline helps us in short term performance it's only generate when you feel some risk or the body needs to respond to something and we respond brilliantly uh to that our brain our brain loves taking risks uh it loves trying to solve new problems uh we're curious curious and inquisitive and in fact i think when the brain stops making uh when you stop giving it something new you can feel it atrophy you uh, it doesn't make the new connections i believe that's how it grows so it it doesn't make the new connections you need so i believe that this interest you must be interested in other subjects all your life uh, this is right i think something to do with connections as well but you must be interested in lots of other things and be comfortable with the idea of uh, taking risks in chess while it's good to study and no one will ever get anywhere without hard study and preparation there is sometimes a desire uh where you want to work something out to such a degree that you do not have to solve a problem at the board when you're playing and in a way this is a kind of cowardice you you're saying i do not want to solve problems at the board and that is so contrary to what our brain does and for the reason we get into chess or any subject when i got into chess because i want to play and do unknown things and see if i can outfit my opponent if you lose that then you uh, i think destroying the strongest part Uh, of the brain so uh, whenever i i found that uh, i have i want to over prepare in a way this is a conflict you're curious about the real truth of behind a position so you insist on analyzing further and further and further but it's important that when you try to go for a game you must lose a sense of that a little bit because what you do not want to do is to uh, get to the board uh, in a mentality where you're only ready to execute what you've already studied and not do something more because um that's a handicap i mean it works out well sometimes uh, if your opponent falls into the trap but if he doesn't then you're always going to get an unexpected situation uh so keeping your mind open to the possibility of taking risks and doing uh unexpected things is very healthy in a way i think uh, a university is a wonderful place to have a dry run for many of the things you want to try later in life I mean if you want to be an entrepreneur for instance uh you might want to try some of the things out here while the financial trough is not running so to speak um in a way that I sort of the dry runs with my seconds help me get the sensation of what it's like to face a problem at the board you get a healthy sense of that so i think you must have this all your life this ability to balance uh our curiosity with the subject and our desire to know the subject well but never to the stage where um uh you don't want to go out there and uh, solve new things and i really believe that the brain this is what it lives for every day um i remember my school holidays the years when i had nothing to do uh in the school holidays 
Well, of course, the day after the exam, you're very happy because now you have two months off. But if you're not engaging your brain in some way, uh, then I'm sure you know the sensation where after two weeks of your vacation, you've still got five or six weeks left. But you have the feeling that every day is like every other day and, and nothing much is happening. Whereas uh, when you have a couple of vacations and perhaps uh, some nice hobbies to pursue, then uh, the vacation seems to disappear just like that. Um, so really, I think this is the, the fourth and most important thing, uh, the ability to be comfortable with the unknown and realize that that's what our brain lives for, so not to be, never to be afraid of it. The brain has a mind of its own. Um, it's impossible to uh, control, I think, but if you take care of the environment, in every sense, at every stage in life, you um, try to be broadly interested in every subject, even if it's not going to be affect you right away. You have, keep this possibility for the brain to make unexpected connections. Um, and you recognize the role of uh, emotions in the way that you perform, and your peak performance. And you keep uh, some sort of perspective with the uh, desire to take risks then I think uh, you've given your brain every shot uh, to do what it does. Thank you.